scale or as uh, you started out in life, uh, big green versus big iron. Uh, our hope with this panel was to lay down a challenge uh, to the existing industry paradigm, which is that everyone loves to talk about renewables, but when it comes time to figure out where the large firm base load capacity is going to come from for this industry for the next 40 or 50 years, when the adults get in the room to talk about it, it's called nuclear large hydro. And we want to challenge uh, that paradigm and ask whether there's a new paradigm. Um, Tom Friedman wrote in December of 2007 that incrementalism when it comes to clean energy is simply a hobby. Uh, and the graphic in your booklet uh, that accompanies the abstract that shows a generous view of, of uh, what uh, the greenhouse gas impact of all of the current RPS paradigms being met uh, is a picture of incrementalism. So we want to challenge that. Um, we have uh, a wonderful panel with us today. We're honored and thrilled. Uh, and as our moderator, we have Dr. John Holdren, the Teresa and John Hines Professor of Environmental Policy at the Kennedy School at Harvard. And uh, John will uh, introduce the rest of the panel. So with that, Dr. Holdren, the panel is yours. Thank you very much. One thing I would add to the bureaucratic side of this session, but I understand we do have a lot of work about the topic of this uh, panel, which is uh, renewables at scale. And then I will introduce each of the panelists uh, very briefly while uh, posing a question to each one, or uh, a couple of questions, for them to answer uh, briefly in 10 minutes or less. And then we'll open it up to interaction with the audience. Uh, in confronting what I think is the biggest science and technology challenge of our time, which is how to provide the energy needed to create and sustain prosperity everywhere without wrecking the climate with the emissions of carbon dioxide from fossil fuel combustion. We know we're starting from a difficult spot. Worldwide, even when we include the traditional biofuels as a balance sheet, that is, even when we include in the list for the table of the world's primary energy sources, the fuel wood, charcoal, crop waste, and dung, which are often omitted from that tabulation, but in fact are the main energy source for the two billion poorest people in the world, even when you include that stuff, the world today is 82% dependent on coal, oil, and natural gas for its primary energy. The United States is 88% dependent on those fossil fuels for its primary energy. In the electricity generating sector, the fossil fuel share is 66% worldwide and it's 71% in the United States. When you ask, what can we do about that? What can we do in particular about the carbon dioxide emissions that are coming from that immense fossil fuel contribution, both to our primary energy supply and to the electric part of it? We find we have got a relatively limited menu of options. Clearly, I think, the easiest, fastest, cheapest leverage on carbon dioxide emissions is to be found on the demand side, improving end use efficiency in the transport sector, in the building sector, in the manufacturing sector. But a Prius still burns some liquid fuel, a compact fluorescent bulb still uses electricity, and in the end, we cannot solve this whole problem. We cannot do as much as is required 
to adequately reduce the chance of climatic catastrophe unless we reach higher into the tree beyond that low-hanging fruit that's available in the efficiency, the end-use domain, reach higher into the tree and find the ways on the supply side to reduce the CO2 emissions associated with the primary energy supply and with electricity. If you look at how much of that we have to do, if you ask what would it take to be on an emissions trajectory that would correspond to stabilizing atmospheric carbon dioxide at, say, 450 parts per million, which might correspond to something like a 50% chance of staying below a temperature increase of 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial. What you find is we've got to emit something in the range of 4 billion tons of carbon per year, carbon embedded in CO2, below business as usual in 2030, and 8 billion tons of carbon per year below business as usual in 2050. Now, the abstract for this panel, this panel on renewables at scale, talks about what we can do in 5 or 10 years. Why does it do that? Because if we don't get going in 5 or 10 years, the chance of having a really big contribution in 2030 and a much bigger one in 2050 is going to be nil. On the supply side, there are basically three places we can find those multiple gigatons per year of carbon that we need to avoid in 2030 and 2050 in order not to careen onto a trajectory with climatic implications that we're sure not to like. <clears throat> Number one, we could expand nuclear energy at a very large scale. And just for perspective, in order to get a gigaton per year of avoided carbon emissions from nuclear energy, it takes twice as many nuclear power plants as are in operation in the world today. It takes something in the range of 700 new gigawatts of nuclear electricity to avoid one gigaton. Second option is to expand renewable energy on a very large scale. And let me give you a few numbers there. In order to avoid a gigaton with industrial biofuels, assuming that we can do industrial biofuels in a way that does not involve cutting down tropical forests or driving carbon out of agricultural soils, assuming that we can do that, and assuming we can do it in a highly energy efficient way on the production side, it will take about 10 times the volume of industrial biofuels that the world is producing today to avoid a gigaton of carbon. If we look at the so-called new renewables in the form of wind, geothermal, solar energy, it will take about eight times what we have in operation today around the world in those categories, eight times to avoid one gigaton per year of carbon emissions. And again, we've got to avoid altogether something like four in 2030, something like uh, eight in 2050. This is an immense challenge. We not only have to think big, we have to think huge. So I'm going to turn to our panelists to tell us how we ought to be thinking about thinking huge in this category of new renewables. I'm going to start uh, with Maury Dewhurst, who is the Senior VP and Chief Financial Officer of the FPL Group, of which Florida Power and Light is a part. There are a number of other important parts. Uh, Maury, that group, the FPL Group, is the second largest owner of wind capacity in the world. Uh, 2007 capacity, around 5,000 megawatts. Also owns the largest array of solar electric generators uh, in the world with 354 megawatts of parabolic trough solar thermal electric capacity in the Mojave Desert. You also have 360 megawatts of hydro. You've got about 6,000 megawatts of nuclear, 7,100 megawatts of fossil, most of which is natural gas. So number one, you're far more heavily into renewables than most uh, electric power producers in this country. But number two, your generation is still dominated by fossil and nuclear, and of course, even more so in energy terms than in capacity terms. So I have two questions for you. The first, what is it about FPL's thinking about the options and the needs of the market that have motivated you to be so much more bullish about renewables than most other electricity producers in the country? And second, what would it take, what more would it take in terms of technology, incentives, markets, regulations, 
not only for FPL to move more heavily into renewables, but for other major electricity producers in this country to start to do so. Uh, Joe, before I directly address the question, I feel like uh, with that introduction, you're able to be slipping your wrists. Really, really, you make the scale of the problem um, uh, quite immense. Uh, I guess the immediate reaction to that, however, is that every mountain has to be climbed one step at a time. Uh, we're not going to do it all by any one thing. And the direct answer to the two questions, uh, in terms of the things that we have done, I guess, as a company, we have always prided ourselves on trying to look ahead and anticipate what market conditions may be 10 or 20 years in the future, given that we invest in uh, very capital-intensive projects with long lives. Uh, and a particular part of that has been trying to anticipate uh, what sort of regulatory environment we will be operating in. And for a long time, we have had the, the view that we can expect over time consistently tied to environmental regulations of all kinds. And so we have tried to incorporate that view as we think about our investment decisions. So as a consequence, we have been uh, active in the renewable sphere since the 80s. Uh, a second part of why we are where we are today is that in the course of those 20 plus odd years, we have managed to make every mistake I think that is possible to make uh, in the renewable space. We have tried virtually every form of renewable. Fortunately, we made most of our mistakes on a very small scale. Uh, and so in the late 90s, when it became apparent that there would be a more significant opportunity in wind in particular, that the technology had reached a stage where the economics were improving significantly, we could start to see the potential for uh, eventually carbon restrictions on the horizon. Uh, it was natural for us to expand what we were doing. Uh, we've also had a philosophy uh, which applies much beyond renewables, that if we can take uh, an investment that makes sense on the economics today, but has significant potential upside against what may or may not, but have a good chance of being long-term trends, that's a pretty sensible business proposition. So that's really the, the, answer to, uh, the short answer to why we are where we are today. Uh, as for what it's going to take to do more, I guess my first response for us is we are trying to do more, and uh, I, it's hard to conceive of how much more we could do. Why do I say that? We have about 5,000 megawatts of wind uh, in the installed base today. That gives us roughly a third of the U.S. installed base, about 30 percent. Uh, we have plans to uh, effectively more than triple that in, through the 2012 time period. Uh, along with other significant investments that we'll be making uh, across the portfolio, we will be committing over the course of the next five years something on the order of 40 billion of cap. To put that in perspective, our market cap today is on the order of 25 billion. So 8 billion a year on average capital expenditures is a huge problem. And the constraints for us literally are uh, physical, uh, human capital, being able to manage scaling up of a, a huge set of uh, activities. So we are doing about as much uh, as we know how to do, subject to our own resources, the state of the technology, and the state of the economics, both the wind side and solar. We're very active in solar, both within Florida and outside. Uh, I think the same can be said for much of the rest of the industry, although I think it's fair to say that the, much of the rest of the industry is behind us. Uh, but there are some significant practical constraints, in my view, to the development of renewables, and we shouldn't kid ourselves about them. Uh, I would put them into three general categories, uh, ultimately all boil down to one, which is the first one, economics, uh, and two aspects of economics. First of all, the cost of renewables is too high today. Wind is by far the most economic, and in certain areas, it can be standalone economic on an energy-only basis, but that's not good enough. Most of the renewables are essentially capital, very little operating cost, obviously no fuel cost. Uh, we need to see the capital costs come down, so technology obviously comes in there. So we've got to see improvements in the cost of the renewable, and the other aspect of economics is opportunity cost. Today, there is no explicit cost of carbon baked in. 
we need to see that, which means that this country needs to move forward with a sensible uh, and pretty broad-based regulatory framework to make sure that carbon is priced into every decision that every economic actor uh, in the economy makes. So we're going to have economics that are going to have to change. They are changing, but as you've heard from some of the other speakers earlier, it will take time. Secondly, we need to take account of the particular characteristics of renewables. They are what they are. The resources are not equally distributed. It's sunnier in certain parts of the country than it is in others. The wind blows better in certain parts of the country than it does in others. In many cases, the best resource is not where the people are. There are ways of dealing with those things, but we mustn't think just in terms of the renewable technology itself. So things that give us quasi-storage, some of the things that uh, Bob's company is working on, are very, very important. Dynamic pricing, plug-in hybrids, the holy grail of the utility industry, not just for the incremental demand, but for the way in which it would allow us to use more renewables and integrate them better into an overall system. And finally, the biggest one of all, which is transmission. It is no good being able to generate a million megawatts of power in the desert southwest if you can't get that power up to Cambridge where people need it. So the second broad category that needs to change is we've got to adapt to the characteristics of the renewable resources themselves. And then the third element of, I think, realism in here is we have to think about constraints on how rapidly we can grow. It's a huge challenge, as you pointed out. It can't be addressed overnight. And in fact, the more rapidly we try and address it, the worse we make the problem. What do I mean by that? The faster we try and grow, the more pressure we'll put on the supply chain. Manufacturers like General Electric, they can only expand their capacity at a certain pace. They're trying hard, they're expanding, but there's a limit to how quickly we can do that. So if we put too much pressure on growth, we end up simply driving up the cost of what we're trying to do. In addition, we don't give ourselves as a, a society the benefit of technology evolution. The more we commit today, the more we are eliminating essentially the possibility to capitalize on where technology will be a few years from now. And since technology is changing so very rapidly, that is an important constraint. So we need to grow, we need to put the pedal down pretty hard on the growth front, but we also have to accept that there are practical trade-offs to how quickly you can do that. We are starting from, as John pointed out, a very, very small base. So our 5,000 megawatts, just to put that in perspective, U.S. capacity across the board is on the order of a million megawatts. So it's tiny. Solar is even tinier. And as John also pointed out, on an energy basis, because the capacity factors, the proportion of time you're delivering energy is typically lower with renewables like wind and solar, uh, on an energy basis, it's even lower. So a couple of comments on uh, not to uh, rain on our own renewables parade. We are you know, very bullish on renewables. We think there are huge opportunities. But when you are starting from a small base, even very rapid growth rates, which carry their own substantial execution challenges over the next few years, don't get us very far. But project them out over 20 or 30. And it can be one element, just one, of uh, in the, the Sokolow framework, one of the slices of how we uh, tackle the overall problem. Thank you, and I should apologize. In my opening remarks, I meant to list the three ways to get at it, and I only listed two. The third, of course, which has been discussed here, is CO2 capture and sequestration from fossil fuel uh, technologies of various kinds. If you look at the scale of that, it exists today only on a pilot scale. We'd need to ramp that up by a factor of a thousand from today's global level in order to avoid a gigaton uh, per year. Uh, let me uh, turn to our second panelist, uh, Robert Fishman. Uh, Bob, you are the CEO of OSRA, which is in the business of utility scale solar thermal power generation. Uh, I understand you're working with FPL on a solar thermal project in Florida. You're working with uh, PG&E on uh, a big one, 177 megawatts in California. And last month, your company released a report that argued that from a technical standpoint, 
solar thermal electric power plants with 16 hours of storage could provide something like 90% of U.S. electricity generation, even with a load curve that had been bolstered by a large plug-in hybrid vehicle fleet. Uh, I looked at that report, found it uh, on the web. Uh, there's not much about economics in it, and I wonder if you could say something about the economics of getting a large fraction of United States electricity from solar thermal plants, including what you think the cost of that 16 hours of storage would be. And another part of the economics question that I would be delighted if you could address is uh, what carbon emissions price it would take for uh, that system, that solar thermal electric system with storage, to become competitive with coal-fired generation. I think the lapel mics work now, by the way. We, we... Can anybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, at the risk of contradicting our dinner speaker last night, I think that thermal storage is actually fundamental to making uh, solar thermal power a uh, significant contributor to, to the energy solution. Um, without storage, the capacity factor uh, for a solar thermal power plant is between 25 and say 29 percent depending on where you are in the, in the, in the southwest. Um, and frankly that's not good enough. It's not good enough on a lot of levels. It's not good enough to solve the correlation between uh, grid demand and solar production, for example. California summer peak demand is noon to about 8 p.m. That's the peak pricing period for PG&E. Peak generation for a solar thermal power plant is about 10 a.m. to 5.30, 6 o'clock. So at a very minimum, if you want to do maximum correlation with generation and demand, you need to time shift your generation two hours. Um, but having said that, what you really want to do, if you've gone to the trouble to build the turbine infrastructure, uh, secure transmission access, is you really, and pay for a, a thermal power plant in the, uh, the steam turbine, heat rejection system, and transmission, uh, you really would like to get more utilization out of that infrastructure, which is expensive, than 25 to 29 percent. As it turns out, if you look at the economics of increasing the size of the solar field and storing the heat, in order to extend your number of operating hours, you find that with incremental additions of storage, you can drive the capacity factor up to 40 or even 60 percent. Uh, beyond that, it seems to be diminishing returns. Now, the, the, the correct answer to that is going to depend on the load mix of the market that you're in and what would carry the load at night. So if you have nuclear and hydro to carry the load at night, there's very little need for solar thermal to, to run through the night. On the other hand, if you're you know, gas or coal on the margin at night, then that would be a, a different calculation. So we've been modeling incremental storage and what that does to our economics at two-hour increments starting at two hours and going up to 16. Beyond 16, it, it appears that uh, you, there's no further gain. In fact, the economics begin to, to decline. So right now we're thinking that somewhere between 6 and 12 hours is probably an optimum storage. So what does that do to your economics? Well, nominally right now the solar thermal power plants that are in development by us and our competitors are offering prices without storage in the 12 to 14, 12 to 15 cent a kilowatt hour range, assuming reinstatement of the 30 percent investment tax credit. If you put in thermal storage, say to get to a 40% capacity factor, provided your storage is economical, you could drive your cost down into the 9 to 10 cents a kilowatt hour range. That presupposes that the incremental capa capacity factor gain you're getting from the thermal storage is uh, greater than the incremental capital cost that the storage costs you. And if, if it's the same proportion, then you haven't driven your cost down. You just end up holding ground, but at a higher capacity factor. So where does that put you with respect to conventional technologies? I don't know if you can read this. This is it. 
little study that we did internally. Uh, a new build coal plant at $3,000 a kilowatt, and sorry folks, but that's what it's going to cost. Without carbon capture, uh, nominal capacity factor gives, in today's forward strip uh, for coal, gives you a cost of $68 a megawatt hour for a coal plant. If you assume a carbon uh, cost, what, however that gets implemented, of $30 a ton, which is a number I hear a lot, that's worth about $20 a megawatt hour. That means that a new build coal plant is $80 to $100 a megawatt hour uh, average cost. If you try to do a coal plant with carbon capture and sequestration, you, you're, you've just gone up another 50%. Uh, Mike will disagree with me. I think with IGCC, you don't really gain much ground, although that has other environmental attributes but we won't, we won't go there right now. If you then go to looking at a combined cycle plant with a lesser carbon tax, just because the carbon value is low, you find out you're, you're in pretty much, you're, you're slightly higher than coal, but it's getting pretty close. So now let's jump down the page and look at the, the renewable options. Wind is the cheapest, but it's, it's not a dispatchable solution. It's an energy solution. It's not a capacity solution. Uh, I'll skip over PV for a moment and, and come down to solar. So solar thermal without storage today, capacity factors I talked about give you, you know, 11 to 14 cents a kilowatt hour. And with storage, driving up the capacity factors, as I said, you're in the 8 to 10 cent a kilowatt hour range. Uh, and that really makes it very interesting because now what you just said is I can do carbon-free energy that's cost competitive uh, with coal even at $30 a ton, and one could argue the true cost of carbon is far higher than $30 a ton, especially when you look at the sequestration numbers. Okay. So I just want to make one more point. You know, people talk about scale, and people say, you know, the magnitude of the problem is so big, we can't deploy plants on a large scale. So here's a chart. Uh, I think I got this from the EIA. It shows what got built in this country by technology since 1950. And what I find really interesting about this chart are the last eight years. We, jet, we produced, we, we constructed 25% of the capacity of this country's grid with natural gas, largely combined cycle plants, in the last eight years. So clearly, the industry with the right economic incentives has the ability to make a major transformation in the generation technology mix that's on the grid. So when people say we can't do it, and I just, they're just not using enough imagination, we just did it. We just did it in the last 10 years. So it's clearly within our reach, uh, if we begin to scale up, to have a similar large build program uh, with, with low carbon or carbon-free carbon technologies. Terrific. Thank you very much. Uh, our third panelist, whose last name I'm sure to mispronounce, uh, Michael Eidelchik, close uh, enough, hmm? uh, is the Vice President for Advanced Technology at GE Global Research, uh, an operation that has research facilities in the United States, Germany, China, and India. And he previously served as Managing Director of GE's China Technology Center. Uh, Michael, from those vantage points, and also given the involvement of GE Global Research with a wide range of uh, advanced fossil and renewable uh, energy technologies, I think you're well positioned to address a couple of big questions that uh, come up in my mind by the preceding answers. Uh, first, the FPL group is placing big bets on wind and solar thermal electric. Uh, all of OSRA's bets are on solar thermal uh, electric. Uh, and GE is making a much wider array of renewables bets. You're in wind, geothermal, uh, photovoltaics, but you're not in solar thermal. Uh, and uh, so I want to ask you uh, what this says about GE's views about the best bets in the, in the new renewable area over the next 10 years, the next 20 years, uh, going further out. Do you differ with uh, FPL and OSRA about the prospects of solar thermal? Uh, and the second question uh, relates to your own and GE's experience in China and India. How would you say the prospects for greatly expanded contributions from new renewables in those countries 
differ from the prospects in the United States, either in terms of which technologies are most attractive or in terms of markets and incentives? I just want to follow up with, on what Maury said first. Um, we're placing a number of significant bets in uh, diverse green technology areas. One of them is renewable technologies in space. We believe there is no one silver bullet which is going to solve our energy challenges. Rather, it will be a mix of comprehensive technology solutions, which will include, of course, uh, renewable energy solutions, but also will include conventional ones like coal with carbon capture and sequestration. It will include high efficiency natural gas powered uh, turbines, uh, uh, combined cycles, and it will include nuclear. On renewable energy uh, portfolio for GE, we are very much committed to renewable space. As you said, we're investing in both wind. Uh, solar and, and um, what we call a low temperature heat recovery, energy from a low heat recovery sources. In the area of uh, solar, uh, we do not know which technology is going to win. If you look at GE portfolio in technologies, we are a partner in um, Solar America Initiative, we're an industrial partner with, partner with uh, U.S. Department of Energy. And our goal there is really to drive cost of solar energy to be competitive with conventional sources by 2015. We're looking at novel approaches in making solar-grade silicon without huge investments in infrastructure. We're developing uh, very high-efficiency PV systems, silicon-based PV systems. And we're very excited about new uh, technologies, which have been around for a while, but it's progressing very nicely, and it's uh, thin film PV. On commercial size applications, we believe that um, thin film PV, as well as solar, solar thermal, has a real opportunity going forward. Uh, we are evaluating solar thermal, uh, and um, with GE long history in steam turbines, uh, it's just natural for us to look at the space. We also believe that GE uh, capability in materials, systems, and supply chain uh, will be needed to scale up and make thermal solar more competitive. With energy you know, uh, issues uh, in our front door, so to speak, we believe that technology advancements in both solar PV uh, and thermal solar uh, absolutely will make it a significant part of uh, portfolio going forward. The, the, I agree with, with Bob that change can happen very fast. In 2002, G was, was not in wind business. But we have done our homework. We understood technology. We understood manufacturing capabilities. And we understood global supply chain capacity as well. So when we enter a solar uh, wind business, we did so very decisively, and today, this year, we're going to be over $6 billion in revenue from our uh, wind business. Uh, we are evaluating both technologies on a continuous basis, and we will, when we find a right answer, just like we did in wind, we'll enter the space very aggressively, and it could be one or could be bo both technologies. So in my view, uh, change can happen fast. You saw the graph. Most of those gas turbines were shipped by GE. Uh, we actually, uh, in these five years, we shipped more gas turbines to our customers than in previous 25. So we can do it. Uh, we, we have capability in the company to ramp up and do what's right. Uh, and I think we can change the world very rapidly, assuming we have a right solution. And how about China and India? Uh, with China and India, uh, the deployment of uh, renewable resources will be rest, less certain for a while. Of course, uh, affordability is a big deal, but also there is no, you know, without government or businesses or individual uh, action uh, to move renewables forward, I, I believe it will take uh, a while for both India and China to look at wind or solar as a major energy uh, part of, me, of their uh, energy portfolio. 
We see some penetration in wind in China, in Inner Mongolia, and in southern China. We see some wind turbines being built in India, but it's very, very small. It's well under 1%. Any thoughts um, before we go to the audience on um, the ways in which markets and incentives over the next uh, decade, two decades, are likely to differ in China and India from uh, those in the United States? Uh, I do not know what's going to happen with carbon uh, trading, uh, what kind of legislation could be put in place. Uh, how global uh, trading will be conducted. Uh, the one thing we need to remember, uh, I think last year China put in place over 90 gigawatts of power. The vast majority of it was power from coal plants. And with that in mind, uh, the best available technology to optimize efficiency and NOx and SOx emission was not used. So you ask yourself, how would trading in CO2 will be conducted? It's really not clear for us yet. Technology. Okay, uh, now that we got that technological problem solved, I, I guess in my view the big, uh, a, a big hope for changing attitudes on what is needed in China and India resides actually in the bad news that both countries are increasingly being harmed by climate change and are recognizing the harm that's being done in the form of changes in the monsoons that are aggravating patterns of flood and drought, in terms of the melting of the glaciers and the Tibetan plateau that feed their great rivers, aggravating the cycle of flood and, and uh, low water in those rivers. And the result is I spend quite a bit of time in both countries, and the, uh, the leaders at very high levels have come around to understanding that climate change uh, is an issue for them now. And I think over the next uh, five to ten years, this is going to have a substantial influence on how they think about what they deploy both in terms of what kinds of coal technologies they're going to start to think about deploying and in terms of how interested they're going to be in expanding both nuclear and renewables. Uh, that's a personal opinion. Let me uh, throw it open to the audience uh, for questions. Let me just say uh, that questions uh, should be not more than two sentences and the second sentence should end in a question mark. Please. <laughs> Would you like our mic? <laughs> we got we got some mics coming around here. John, I have a question for you. Uh, what's the moral or business case for U.S. gas prices to be less than half of Europe and UK, and even at a thirty percent discount over Indian prices? And as Michael said, that change takes place quickly. Suppose the U.S. gas prices were equal to the European prices. Gasoline, like gasoline. gasoline not yeah. gas, but gasolines. Right. Uh, what, what effect would it have on various issues connected with energy? Well, of course, the big difference between European gasoline prices and U.S. gasoline prices is just the size of the tax uh, being imposed on gasoline. It's obviously not a difference in production cost or transport cost. Uh, or, or anything in that domain. Uh, this really was one of the topics of a previous panel on the other side of the divider, uh, that is, on, on, on this side. Um, and it, it is, I think, very much the case that unless gasoline is quite a lot more expensive, one doesn't get at the vehicle miles traveled component of the gasoline consumption and emissions equation in the vehicle sector. But I'm not sure what the thrust of your question is as, as it relates to this renewables panel. It's about global warming. It's about uh, the U.S. 
Uh, the question is, well, that's a much broader question. When is the United States going to start to be a responsible country uh, in, 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 in terms of greenhouse gas emissions? <laughs> okay, next question. Uh, I, I, I think, uh, n number one, uh, my guess is two years is how long it's going to take before the United States starts to become a responsible country. I think within two years we will have a mandatory economy-wide uh, approach to greenhouse gas emission restraints in the United States. It will probably be a cap-and-trade uh, system with a variety of bells and whistles. Uh, in my view, when we get it, it won't be strong enough. The targets won't be ambitious enough. Uh, they won't ramp up fast enough. If there's a safety valve, it'll be too low. Uh, but I will nonetheless think it a very important milestone, and I think the rest of the world will think it a very important milestone, that the United States has finally got a mandatory economy-wide approach uh, to putting a price on carbon emissions. And I think that's going to make a huge difference in the world. I think it's going to accelerate the willingness of other countries uh, to join uh, such an approach. And I also think, as your question, I guess, implies that it's a scandal that it's taken uh, so long for the United States to get around to this. Um, next question, please. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, like you mentioned, uh, change can happen quickly. And um, as uh, we try to scale up renewables into the market, um, of course, that would put downward pressure on prices of traditional sources of fuel. Um, and, of course, in the 70s, there was a lot of activity going on. GE had a pretty strong wind program back then. And as soon as, um, you know, 1985 rolled around, uh, the programs were canceled, et cetera. And how do you see avoiding something like that happening again? Anybody else want to take a shot at that? GE, um, like, just like any other company, has to follow economics. Uh, and you're right, when prices on oil dropped and prices on other fossil fuel followed, uh, we had to cancel a couple of uh, very major programs in developing uh, alternative energy sources. But it's just economics. Uh, what we see right now, I think it's different. We see India and China who consume a lot of energy and will consume a lot of energy going forward. We see, just think about any commodity, pricing is up. And uh, I think we're living in a different world today than it was in um, late 70s, early 80s. Yeah, but it comes back to the question of regulation. Uh, if we don't have a sensible economy-wide framework, if we don't maintain that consistently over a long, long period, it's not going to happen. So it really comes back until you start putting a price on carbon that is sensible, uh, that escalates steadily over time, that's at least somewhat predictable, uh, we're going to continue to go in stops and you know, fits and starts. I see one back there. Can we get a mic? Uh Thank you. Uh, Henry Daher. Uh, the development investment in renewable has been a factor or has been dependent on the PTC, on the federal, uh, federal incentives so far. So have we reached a stage where with these high prices of gas, uh, we don't anymore depend so much on the PTC or is still a big factor in the development and investment of renewable? Thank well, you. Yeah, uh, in terms of public policy support. You, you might repeat the question because I'm not uh, sure everybody got it. Yeah, the, the, the gist of the question is that renewables to date in this country, uh, particularly wind, have been supported and dependent, uh, the implications of the economics were dependent upon the production tax credit program, which is a program whereby for every uh, kilowatt hour that you produce, you get a tax credit, which today is about two cents. Uh, what happens uh, as that, you know, has when reached the point where it no longer needs that, what happens if it doesn't get extended at the end of this year, before the end of this year, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the first thing to note is there are actually two very important forms of uh, policy support uh, for the wind business. PTCs, certainly, uh, but actually, arguably, the more important one has been historically the state-level renewable portfolio standards. What the PTC has done has enabled uh, suppliers like ourselves to help our customers meet their commitment under a state-level renewable portfolio standard without their end customers seeing a significant increase, not paying a price premium for that. In some cases, they've got a very, very good deal. Uh, so we've effectively socialized that net cost through the tax system. It's actually arguably been pretty effective in that way. Uh, I personally think of the PTC as a substitute for price on carbon. 
Uh, and so one of the things that I tell our investors is that when we get out somewhere in the next decade where there is a meaningful price on carbon, you should not expect that we're going to have PTCs and a price of carbon. How we get from here to there is a little less clear and obviously gets into the politics of it. Uh, having said that, there is no question that with natural gas at eight or nine bucks, uh, there are parts of the U.S. today where good wind projects uh, can stand on their own without that. Uh, but if you go back a few years, we have many projects that we did back in the early part of this decade uh, that are under long-term fixed-price contracts with our customers, and they're paying on the order of 30 bucks a megawatt hour for renewable energy and getting the green tag as well. That is an incredible deal. And so that piece of it definitely has been assisted by the PTCs. Let's see. We've got some uh, over on this side, a couple close together, so the mic can be quickly passed. Um, I, be, I personally experienced two very different environments for new ventures in solar photovoltaics. Uh, on one hand, uh, the Italian government is currently subsidizing uh, production from solar photovoltaics up to 42 cents per kilowatt hour, semi-integrated plants. Um, and this allows businesses to build financial models, pay off for the plans, and make money themselves. Um, and I would argue that actually uh, building up demand in Europe has helped buy down the learning curve of production of solar photovoltaics. On the other hand, the United States collaboration with the local firm has taught me how sometimes starving from government incentives can help push technology forward. So my question to the panelists is, is there a perfect formula for combining these two functions? Thanks. Well, I, you know, I, I, personally, I, I'm not a big fan of, of feed-in tariffs. I think they actually encourage inefficiencies in, in, in technology development. If you, if you set the bar, as they have in Europe, uh, 35, 40, 50 cents a kilowatt hour, where's the incentive for technology breakthroughs to drive the cost down? So I think that what you, you, you really want to do in, in a perfect world, and as, as Maury just said it, is that at the end of the day, if you have priced carbon appropriately, you don't need tax incentives, you don't need green tags. The, the, the market, clear, market, price, market mechanism for clearing carbon should send the right signals for the renewables to be appropriately priced. And I think that's certainly well within reach, and, and if, again, if carbon's appropriately priced. But I think that, that feed-in tariffs, what's the incentive for a, a PV or, for that matter, a solar thermal a technology provider to, to lower his costs if uh, the hurdle is so easily cleared uh, using his current technology? So I, th I think it, it's a disincentive to, uh, to make technological progress. Could I just add to that? Yeah, I agree sure. absolutely with everything Bob said, but I would go further. The way that the, uh, if you are going to do it inefficiently, and by inefficiently I mean anything other than just putting a clean price on carbon, uh, I would argue that the, the way the U.S. has done it has actually been far more effective for getting at some of the issues that Bob is talking about. With a PTC, which essentially buys down the economics of the renewable, we still go in and any customer that needs renewable resources is going to hold a competition. So there is strong price signal, strong incentive to force our industry, the supply industry, and in turn the manufacturers to keep working, pushing down the cost curves. That's not true with the feed-in tariffs. You don't have that same incentive structure. Okay, the next one, please. Um, one of the things I've seen here looking, working on um, energy at the local level is that there are so many ways to say no to renewables. There's NIMBY, there's differences in net metering regulations, there's different state regulations. The recs in one state don't match the recs in another. So there's so many local things that get in the way. How can we overcome these? Well, the first thing we could do is have a national RPS, a one definition of recs. Uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, we've seen this. Historically, we were very comfortable operating in multiple states with different uh, requirements, but what has grown up is just a patchwork quilt that is pretty inefficient right now. So the short answer is you could deal with it with the national RPS. The longer term answer is get a price on carbon. 
It's even actually even more complicated than that. I think the real Achilles heel of deploying renewables on a large scale in the end is going to be transmission. Uh, if, if you're talking about solar, for example, you know, Arizona is the Kuwait of solar power, but the load's back east. So you've got to figure out a way to move that energy from where that resource is to the market, and you're going to cross a lot of state lines doing that. So, you know, right now we have 50 or counting federal, 51 national energy policies. You know, it would be nice to have one set of rules that everybody could operate under uh, because electricity does move across state lines quite a lot. I have to agree with Bob. We, we believe that uh, getting to our infrastructure in transmission and distribution will significantly, if we, we can have one tax on carbon and unify transmission laws among states, it will help a lot. It's probably going to be a single largest driver after carbon tax of, of renewable energy. And by the way, if you think it's tough dealing with NIMBY issues with renewables, try building a new transmission line. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, going to suggest, in fact, that one of the great challenges uh, for the energy industry and a good many others is that NIMBY is rapidly transitioning to banana, which stands for build absolutely nothing anywhere near anybody. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to throw a, uh, a further technical and economic question uh, to our panel. Uh, Bob Fishman was talking about uh, the importance of storage in the case of solar thermal. And uh, obviously solar thermal electric generation has the great advantage that we know quite a bit about how to store energy thermally uh, relatively economically. Uh, the question I have for the panel is how important uh, could further developments in storage become for the non-thermal approaches to electricity generation, photovoltaics and wind, particularly one sometimes hears about uh, progress in compressed air storage. Uh, one hears about uh, the possibility of uh, other approaches, including superconducting magnets, uh, including uh, a, a variety of possibilities. Uh, how big a deal is this? Are there prospects for the scalability of wind and photovoltaics being improved by uh, breakthroughs or advances in storage? Uh, I just want to point out that there's one experiment going on right now, which is quite a fascinating experiment. Uh, GE is working with the Department of Energy in utilities in Hawaii on the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative. Uh, some of you probably know Hawaii is close to 10% penetrated right now with renewable power. Most of the non-renewable power actually comes from diesel fuel. Um, and the uh, eventual goal for Hawaii is to reach 70% uh, of renewable power by 2030. On the big island of Hawaii today, it's around 14% penetrated. And we've done a lot of studies on the grid, understanding how to um, modify transmission distribution, how to use um, fast, dispatchable resources like pickers to uh, firm up uh, wind and solar, where to use energy storage. And, and that experiment is actually very fascinating. We can see a way to probably close to 30 to 40 percent of renewable penetration without really any major changes in the structure of, Hawaii, uh, of, the, of the grid in Hawaii, assuming you put right uh, dispatchable sources in the right places. Just tackle the, uh, maybe a little bit of the economic side of it. Uh, I think it's important to distinguish two aspects to storage. What Bob is talking about is, in essence, the application of storage to enhance the basic economics at the project level. And it really works there because in a solar thermal plant, you've got the turbine, the back end system, and if you're not generating the steam, you're not fully utilizing that capital. So there it can make real, it can be very important at the project level. It's not really the same, at least in my judgment, for wind and PV, because they are much more system resources. In the case of wind, our experience and our customers' experience has been that within any local control area, you are always dynamically matching supply and demand. You can accommodate up to 15, 20 percent of a fluctuating source because you accommodate fluctuating load all the time. So it can be up to that level managed in and integrated into the system with very little uh, incremental 
shaping right. cost. Uh, so then your question on storage becomes fundamentally more technical one, which is storage for the grid overall to deal with the, the load shape. And uh, you know, I defer to the expert on my left on the technical issues. As I said, we, we believe that uh, on the large, at the large <coughs> system level, uh, having a strategically placed dispatchable, fast dispatchable resources and energy storage as needed to firm up mostly frequency variations, mm -hmm. uh, you can achieve a very high penetration. So we're actually going to demonstrate it in the island of Hawaii. Good. Well, I'm getting all kinds of signals from the floor, from the next <laughs> panel, from the... Uh, managers on all sides that it's time for this panel uh, to say farewell. Uh, I want to thank the panelists for uh, very informative contributions. Uh, I leave this discussion uh, even a little more optimistic than I was before about the scalability of the new renewables, uh, and, I, and I thank you for that little dose of optimism. Sure.